I'll tell you, that will definitely lift your hearts. And I, I cannot imagine, I said this in the earlier service, I cannot imagine anywhere else in the world that you could have experienced any greater worship and being ushered into the presence of the Lord than what you experienced right here this morning. And do every week at First Baptist Indian Trail. Thank you so much, Matthew, Alvin, Choir and Orchestra. Wow, how powerful and how moving. Well, it's great to be here at First Baptist Indian Trail back again. And uh, Beth and I are, are so blessed to uh, be able to be here in this church. Uh, time and again, when I'm not out preaching somewhere else, we have the pleasure of worshiping here, and so this feels like home in so, so many ways. And uh, we're just so thankful for First Baptist Indian Trail. Mike and Kathy have been such incredible blessing to us through all of these years, and someone I could always call, someone I could always seek counsel from, and uh, he has been a dear friend and a champion for the Lord. And uh, just a really, uh, he's almost become an institution, Brother Mike has right here in Indian Trail and uh, in Union County. Yeah, go ahead. I know you love your pastor, as you should, and I love him too. So uh, I'm grateful for this time. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. I, I saw these flags, and what a moving, moving song there as folks came and shared uh, in every language or several languages this morning, and what a blessing that was. And, and uh, Romans chapter 1 has an, a fascinating passage in it because I, I've come to realize that as believers that many, many times we, we stop and realize that we want our lives to count for something. Isn't that true? I mean, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you quickly realize that, that God has a purpose and He has a plan for your life. And you want Him to use you to the uttermost, if you will. You, you want him to take your life and, and let it be, as we sing, consecrated, Lord, to thee. We want our lives to count for something. We want our lives to make an impact. And we know, of course, that the Lord Jesus is the greatest soul winner that ever lived, right? Uh, I mean, literally, it didn't matter where he was. He could be meeting a Samaritan woman uh, by a well, and he was willing to offer her living water and share the truth with her. He could be meeting a blind man along the side of the road named Bartimaeus, and he could give him sight, and he would share with him the gift of life. He could be meeting anyone, anywhere, under any circumstance, and he was always willing to share with them the truth of the gospel and the power behind it. We also know that the Apostle Paul was probably really and truly the world's greatest missionary, right? And I know you've been looking throughout this month of missions at, at great missionaries and, and the things that Paul had written Timothy. And, and I want you to go back with me here in Romans chapter 1 for a few moments this morning because I want us to look at, at a clue that Paul gives us that really, I think, marks the foundation or explanation for why Paul was so effective in his work, why he made such the impact that he made. And as I said, I think many of us here this morning want our lives to count. We want to be used for him. And the question ultimately becomes, how far are we willing to go? How obedient are we willing to be in order for our gifts and talents and lives to truly be placed in the hand of the Father and Him use us as a finely tuned instrument in His kingdom? I want you to stand, if you would, in honor of the reading of the Word of God. I want us to look at three verses very quickly this morning right here in Romans chapter 1. He says in verse 14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Father, I just pray in these moments that you would speak to our hearts. 
I pray that as we leave here in a little bit this morning, God, that that we would leave here having met with you, that we would leave here having known that we had come into the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, we have had your word presented to us. And Father, that we have been faithful to receive that which you would say. Lord, I don't know what plans and purposes you have for every individual in this place, but you do. And Father, I pray that this morning that they would listen and to the Spirit of God as you penetrate their hearts. And Lord, that each of us would respond in faith and respond in obedience. And dear Lord, I just pray personally that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I want you to notice three phrases really quick in three verses. And I want you to underline them, if you will, because they help us understand what was behind and what was moving the Apostle Paul to be as effective in doing whatever it was God asked him to do. I want you to look in verse 14 and underline the phrase, I am a debtor. I am a debtor. In verse 15, I'd invite you to underline the phrase, I am a ready. I am ready. And in verse 16, I invite you to underline the phrase, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Because within those three phrases, in those three verses, the apostle Paul in writing this letter in the very first chapter of his letter to the believers in Rome begins to help us understand What was moving him? And number one, I want you to jot down this word because it all starts, you ready? With a burden. It all starts first with a burden. You see in verse 14, he says, I am a debtor to both the Greeks and to the barbarians. Now, if you circle that word debtor, We know what a debtor is, right? A debtor is somebody who is bound by an obligation. In fact, the background of that word is critical to understanding this passage. When we hear the word debtor in in our generation as Americans, we automatically think of what? A financial debt, right? We think of finances. If you've ever had a mortgage, you know that, that you owe that debt to the bank for the house that you're living in. And they expect you to send a check every month for that mortgage. Maybe if you've ever bought a car and gotten a car loan, you are in debt. You are obligated to pay for that car on a monthly basis. When we see that word debtor, we automatically think financial debt to someone or to some institution. But the Apostle Paul here is not talking about a financial debt. No, he's speaking of a spiritual debt. And that's critical to understand. He is speaking from the sense of what he owes because of what Jesus has done for him. Did you hear what I said? He is speaking out of a sense of what he owes and will owe for the rest of his life because of what Jesus has done for him. You you see, in other words, Paul got it. Paul got it. He understood. And he didn't just understand with a mental assent. He understood with his whole life what Jesus Christ had done for him. It was more than just words on a page. It was more than just doctrine that he might have been taught. For Paul, it summed up who he was. He understood what it meant that Jesus had died on the cross for him. He literally understood what it meant that Jesus had forgiven him of all of his sins. He literally understood what it meant that Jesus had brought a peace into his life that passed all understanding. 
and took a man who was a persecutor of Christians, who was hunting down young believers and persecuting them, stoning them even unto death. And he replaced that restlessness, he replaced that wickedness with a peace that passed all understanding. And Paul understood what that meant. He understood that Jesus had made him a new creature, a new creation. Behold, old things were passed away and all things had become new. And Paul understood that he was no longer bound in his sin of humanity that had him on a destination to a devil's hell, but that because of Jesus, his destination was now to a heavenly home. And the bottom line, can I just put it right where we live? Paul understood what Jesus had done for him and he never got over it. He never got over it. And that's the question. That's the question of the hour. Because so many of us in today's world, even in Christendom, in church world, in church life, we fear that many have gotten over the majesty and the mystery and the glory of what Jesus Christ really has done in your life. And it's out of this sense of, of obligation and it's out of this sense of burden, if you will, that is now in Paul's heart. And he says, every morning that I get up, I realize that I no longer belong to myself. I've been bought with a price and I belong to Him. Let me ask you something. Do you have that burden this morning? Do, do you have that burden when you get up? Because it's a burden that's real. And it's a burden that never leaves you. It's very different from walking around with a burden of sin that pulls you down. Because this is an obligation and a burden that lifts you up of never getting over what Jesus has done for you to where Paul says, listen, I am and forever will be in debt to the Lord Jesus Christ for all he's done for me. But not only did Paul give us this clue of, of why he became so effective that it was real and and a burden in his heart. But look at the second phrase in verse 15 real quick. Because the second phrase tells us, so is as much as in me, as is, as is in me, I am ready. Now, I asked you to circle that, that word ready or underline that phrase, I am ready. And, and I want you to write out in the margin, fire. And, and I tell you that because there is fire in that word ready. That word ready there that's translated, I am ready, that, that comes from a, the Greek word that, that is translated to our English word for which we get our word thermometer or thermostat. It literally means heat. And what Paul is basically saying right here is he's saying, I'm heated up about something. He is saying, I am passionate about something. He is saying, I am fired up about something. You know why? Because of the burden that he carried. The second word I want you to write down is it produced a boldness in his life. A boldness. A boldness that he could not ever have any other way. You know, when you read the New Testament and you follow the missionary journeys of Paul, that there was a pattern or, or a system I mean, Paul was just like you and, and just like me. He'd gotten saved on the road to Damascus and, and Christ changed his life forever. He, he was just like you, just like me. He, he answered God's call to be obedient and, and to go. But, but listen, there, just like you and me in Paul's humanity, he always developed a pattern. There was always seeming to be a system to what he did. So when he went on his missionary journeys, 
the system always seemed to kick in. He would always go to a city, and the first place he would go was downtown. He would go to the center of the city. Well, why did Paul always go downtown? Because that's where all the people in that day would gather. And he wanted to go where the people were. So he, he went downtown, and, and his first stop, once he got to the city, is he always went into the synagogue. You know, I, I really actually thought about that yesterday as all of America grieved at a terrorist that walked into a synagogue in Pittsburgh screaming, all Jews must die and pulled, out, pulled that gun and killed 11 Jewish people in cold murder, the worst Jewish massacre in the United States soil in United States history. 11 of them killed in cold blood as they had gathered for, for their worship. And I thought about the day we live in where a terrorist would go in. And, and yet I thought back, the Apostle Paul, he would always go into the synagogue, but, but he was going there with love in his heart. He was going there with hope to be able to offer. He was going there with peace with it among fellow Jews in order to share with them what difference Jesus had made in his life. And, and Paul would go to that synagogue and, and he would begin to share the gospel and, and almost always they would take Paul and how did they react? They would ask him to leave. They would show him the door. They would push his luggage out into the street because they didn't want to hear that gospel. But what I would point you to is when Paul got thrown out and Paul's luggage was following after him, did he gather his things, give up, and say, I'm going home? Did he? No. Well, well, well surely he got discouraged and, and he just said, forget it. No. What did Paul do? Paul gathered his things and he went to the nearest next synagogue. He went to the nearest next place. And then he finally would say, I'm going to just take the gospel to the Gentiles. Whoever I meet, wherever I meet them, whatever their situation, I'm going to share with them what Jesus Christ has done for me. Why did he do it? He said because he had a burden in his heart and he was ready. He was ready. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you this morning if you've got that fire. I want to ask you this morning if you've got that passion. I wonder if you've got that boldness to be willing to listen to God when He leads you to do something that may be uncomfortable. Are you willing to listen to God and go to a place somewhere in the world as a missionary to share the gospel even though you don't know that much about it. Are you willing to be bold enough to lay everything aside and say, Lord, here I am. You see, maybe one reason we're not seeing more people go to the mission field around the world, maybe one of the reasons we're not seeing more people stepping out in faith is because somehow they've gotten over what Jesus did for them. And they no longer have that boldness to be willing to say, Lord, I'll go anywhere under any circumstances at any time Because I love you. You know, the Apostle Paul, when you really sum up what happened with him, it's pretty fascinating. Because he, he took the gospel to Jerusalem. He was ready. He was fired up. And Jerusalem at that time would represent the religious center of the world. All religion would meet there in Jerusalem. And when he shared the truth of the gospel there, you know what happened to him? He got mobbed. 
and they would run him out of town. When he went to Athens, and, and Athens represented the intellectual center of the world. It would be like all of the Ivy League schools, all of academia gathered there in Athens. And Paul, he was bold, he was ready. And when he delivered the gospel in Athens, they didn't mob him to run him out of town, but they mocked him and made fun of him, considered him a simpleton scoffed the Bible teaches us that Paul also went to Rome and Rome at that time represented the legal and political center of the known world he was ready to stand they didn't mob him like they did in Jerusalem and they didn't even mock him like they did in Athens, in Rome. He was martyred and he was executed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're sitting there right now and you're going, Mark, how did Paul do it? He had an obligation. He had a burden that he never got over. It produced in him a boldness to go wherever he was called to stand up and speak up the truth. You say, but Mark, I, I know that, but, but how did he do it? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Because the how... It's what you find in verse 16. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it all comes down to what you really believe. It comes down to belief. You either believe something or you don't. And a lot of people can talk a good game. Oh, I, yeah, I believe this. Yeah. We'll see how much you believe it when the chips are down. We'll, we'll see how much you believe it when your life's on the line, talk's cheap. And that's why the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. That word that you have in verse 16, it's ashamed, I'll ask you to circle that. And over in the margin, you might write the word embarrassed because that's what it literally means. Paul literally says, the gospel does not embarrass me. Why, why doesn't it embarrass you, Paul? Because I understand the power of it. I understand what it means and I understand what it does. The dunamis, the power behind it. And, and that's what Paul is saying here. I am not embarrassed. Look, look, I've often wondered when I've read that, why did he phrase it that way? I mean, Paul could have been, everything else in this phrase or these verses have been somewhat positively spoken. Why didn't he say, I am proud of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why, why didn't he say, I have a high view of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why, why didn't he say, I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? He could have said it any of those ways and made the same point, but he didn't. He said, I am not embarrassed. I am not ashamed. Why did he say it that way? I'll tell you why. Because as Paul traveled to those New Testament churches of Colossae, Thessalonica, Philippi, Corinth, Rome, as he traveled to those churches that had been planted, listen, Paul saw far too many believers in the young New Testament church whose lives 
were being lived as if they were embarrassed and ashamed of the gospel. And he is calling them out. And he was saying, not me. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now look, Paul understood what they were facing. Listen, I'm going to just tell you something. The gospel brings with it the danger of intellectual shame. And, and Paul knew it when he went to Athens, man. I mean, there are people that, that think if you believe in the simple gospel of the Lord that you're not quite with it intellectually. And they'll question your intellect. Man, I've seen that in the last year in my own life. People that would challenge my intellect. When you try to stand on truth. And listen, it comes with a danger of a social shame. I mean, listen, you know as well as I do, everybody wants to be accepted in the group, right? Nobody wants to be left out. But sometimes if you believe the gospel and stand on the word, there is a social stigma that will perhaps put you on the sidelines or maybe even open you up to ridicule behind your back or to your face because that's a social stigma. Or, or then what bothers me perhaps the most is, is this moral shame that they try to, to place on believers if you don't go along with the changing morals of that day, you know? You know, they used to call it a new morality. And Billy Graham said, uh-uh, it ain't new and it ain't moral. And I think he was right. And, and, but, but if you don't go along with the new morals of the day, they might call you closed-minded. They, they might call you old-fashioned. They may call you narrow. They, they may even call you a fundamentalist. I know that bothers some of you. Can, can I just be straight up with you this morning? The memorials of our day have hit rock bottom to the extent that you and I as believers in Jesus Christ have to make a decision every day and that is we're either going to stand with Jesus and stand on this word or we're going to be more worried about being popular with this world. And we got to decide that every day. And, and, and I just want you to know that, that really and truly We've got to be courageous to stand up. Every one of us here. And do something. Do something with it. Recently, just a week or so back, that great piece of literature called the Charlotte Observer, or I call it the Charlotte Disturber, decided to not endorse me in this race I'm in but instead my opponent. But what fascinated me and quite frankly bothered some of my closest friends more than anything was they gave really no reason of basis to endorse my opponent but took time in the article to say why they wouldn't endorse me and it came down to three things. Mark Harris still believes homosexuality is a sin Mark Harris still believes in the Genesis account of creation. And Mark Harris still believes in traditional family of a mother and a father and a child, husbands and wives. And because of that, we just can't go with him. Well, I got news for the observer and news for everybody across this state or this land. I'm willing to go down in flames and willing to die for the word of God. I don't need popularity. I don't need an endorsement. I'm going to stand on the word and I don't need to defend that because the word of God is the word of God. And we as believers have got to understand the days in which we are living. And Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And I say to you this morning, and I hope you can say to me this morning, neither am I. 
May none of us be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because we know the power of the gospel. Because one day it changed my life. One day I came to the cross of Jesus. I repented of my sin. I placed my faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. And I surrendered my life to him. And he changed me. And I've never been the same. I never want to get over it. I always want to be bold because it's what I believe. It's what I believe in the Word of God. What I'm asking you, what I'm asking you this morning is are you willing to be the witness? Are you willing to stand up? Speak up in this generation. Listen, God never leaves a generation without a witness. God never leaves a place of business without a witness. God never leaves a home without a witness. God will raise up a standard. God will raise up a witness in any situation, including our day, in our generation. Oh, listen, it was 1994. The scene was the national prayer breakfast. They had brought in a guest of honor to address that national prayer breakfast. President Clinton and his wife were there. Vice President Al Gore and his wife were there. All the dignitaries from literally around the world had gathered for the national prayer breakfast. The speaker that morning turned out to be the strangest witness. A little girl who had traveled from Albania to India. All she carried with her was a little pail. And in that pail was a toothbrush and two change of clothes. She made her way by foot from Albania to India. And there, as she grew up, she began a house of dying and cared for the sick and the infirmed. The world came to know her as Mother Teresa. And while we disagree with her creed, oh, I got to tell you, the world must love her conviction. Because that day in 1994, Mother Teresa was the speaker. And Mother Teresa, in her statement, I close with this because it's so pertinent, simply said this, and I quote Mother Teresa, <clears throat> but I feel the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is a war against the child a direct killing of the innocent child murder by the mother herself and if we accept that a mother can kill her own child how can we tell other people not to kill one another how do we persuade a woman not to have an abortion as always, we must preserve her with love and remind ourselves that love means to be willing to give until it hurts. Jesus gave even his life to love us. So the mother who is thinking of abortion should be helped to love. That is to give until it hurts her plans, her free time to respect the life of her child. The father of that child, whoever he is, must also give until it hurts. By abortion, the mother does not learn to love, but kills even her own child to solve her problems. And by abortion, the father is told he does not have to take responsibility at all for the child that is brought into the world. That father is likely to put other women in the same trouble. So abortion just leads to more and more abortion. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use any violence to get what they want. This is why the greatest destroyer of love and peace is abortion. End quote of Mother Teresa. When she finished that day, 95% of those in attendance stood with thunderous applause. The president and his wife did not applaud and did not stand. The vice president and his wife did not applaud 
and did not stand. As custom is, when an event like that is over, everyone remains seated until the president exits the room. President Clinton walked over to shake the hand of Mother Teresa, to which she simply looked up at him, small in stature, but she pointed that little finger and she said to him, stop killing the babies. Stop killing the babies. And left. God never leaves a generation without a witness to speak the truth, to stand for the truth, regardless of what man may say, regardless of how they may smear you, regardless of how they may attack you, regardless of how they may try to take things you've said, pull them out of context, and make you out to be something that you wouldn't even recognize, much less anybody around you. Regardless of all the world does, May God raise up some witnesses who will stand on the truth of his word. Would you bow your heads right where you are, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over the sanctuary. Listen, I'm just asking you right now, simply where you are, to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he may be saying to you. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Well, that would explain why you've never had that burden I'm talking about. You've never really felt a sense of obligation to tell others what Jesus has done for you. Because you've never had the burden. I'm telling you, when he changes your life, when you're born again, when you're saved, there's a new burden, a new obligation that'll lift you up. And you can't help but tell others what Jesus has done for you. You may be here this morning and, and you need to come. Take one of the counselors, pastors by the hand and say, I want to be saved this morning. I want to surrender my life to Christ. I want to know this peace that passes all understanding. I, I want to know this hope eternal. I want to know what it is to be a new creation, a new creature. I want old things to be passed away in my life. I want what Jesus wants for me. Why don't you come give your life to him today, would you? Or, or maybe you're here and God's leading you to join this great church. You can come and again, Take someone by the hand down here and say, God's leading me. Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe you know you're saved, but that boldness is missing. And I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and come and get on this altar. And maybe ask the Lord to give you a fresh touch of His power, a fresh touch of His grace, a fresh touch of His mercy and to renew in you that right spirit that would be used like never before. Would you come to Him today?